Okay, so this is a former keynote, and it's pretty much Fed heavy, um, because I wanted to sort of ask people what they've seen, what has changed over the years for them, things that they'd talked about previously in their uh, keynotes. Looking back now, were they accurate? Were they inaccurate? You know, where'd they screw up, and what'd they get right? Where do they see uh, going forward? And since information security seems to be moving really quickly nowadays, and we are really in the spotlight, we're getting a lot more attention than ever before. I think that's sort of a blessing and a curse. Uh, maybe a curse in the sense that if everybody's hanging on every word you say, if you, if you say the wrong thing, it's like, finally, this is my day in the, you know, in the sun. And you try to do everything in 15 minutes that you wanted to do for 15 years, that you know, you're setting yourself up for disaster. So, um, so I think we have to be more careful now than ever before in how we portray ourselves and uh, kind of the, the things we're saying. We've got their attention. Now we have to decide what to do with it. So let me uh, start at the end with uh, Tony Sager to introduce himself. Sure. Uh, why don't you just take some time, talk about maybe your perspective a little bit, and then we'll move into a more uh, conversational. Uh, okay, do you want just an intro first? Or what we well, talk about your intro. Just, uh, yeah, let's do intros first and then kind of okay. give uh, more in depth. We'll do. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Tony Sager, and um, as of uh, September, it'll, I'll be a 34 year veteran of the National Security Agency. Uh, thank you. Uh, all of it in what we call uh, information assurance today, so in the defensive mission at NSA. And I've spent that 34 years involved in security testing of one type or another, everything from cryptographic algorithms to product testing, and then out to and including operational testing like the NSA red teams and so forth. So, and over the last five years, I've had the uh, honor of running the organization that does all that for the defensive mission at NSA. So my perspective is a little warped by uh, having watched things break in a myriad number of ways, and probably the last 10 years of my life have been focused on um, how do we solve some of these problems that we have seen countless times over and over again. And when we come back, I'll talk a little bit. I was keynote in uh, 2007 and talked about a number of things that we were doing around public standards and guidance and so forth. Thanks. Great. Next we have uh, Linton Wells. So my name is Lynn Wells. Uh, I'm over at National Defense University where I run a small center on technology and national security policy. Before that, I spent 16 years in the Office of Secretary of Defense, including um, a couple of years as uh, DOD Chief Information Officer. I think my first time here was 2000, 2001, uh, and I uh, was just reflecting in the discussions here about you know, not only how much has changed, but how much has remained the same in terms of how much more slowly the government is responding than the threat is evolving. So that's uh, something I've talked about. And finally, we have uh, Bob Stratton. I, uh I'm Bob Stratton. I'm an independent consultant uh, out of the D.C. area. Um, more recently, I was uh, the director of government research at Symantec. Uh, I've done a couple of venture-funded and bootstrap security startups and was a part of a novel experiment a while back to create a venture capital arm for the Central Intelligence Agency, which is now covering the whole intelligence community. Um, and uh, so I guess part of my Focus. No, no. you got to talk about your, your early days. Oh, well, yeah, there is that. Um, I founded the security organization at UUNet, which was one of the first tier one internet service providers. Um, had an audit and pen test consultancy. Yeah, you did the first pure play security practice, the wheel group? Yeah, uh, the first network IDS, commercial network IDS, um, and uh, which we sold to Cisco. Then I did a con pen testing consultancy, which I sold to Scilink. So I guess I'm kind of the yeah. reluctant business semi-fed guy. <laughs> well, and at one point, the one thing I like about Bob is at one point, almost all of Usenet went through his basement. Yeah. So th thanks, Bob, for keeping Usenet running for all those years. <laughs> well done. Absolutely. Yeah, it was heating his house. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, so that's your perspectives. <clears throat> and uh, so we'll go back now to uh, Tony and uh, give you a little bit more time to, if there's any questions or things you want to flesh out. And then I'll start, uh, we'll do that again with everybody a little bit more in depth now that we know your perspective. And, um, and then I'll tease out some questions and we'll open it up for audience participation and we'll just see what happens. That sounds great, Jeff. Thanks. So maybe talk a little bit about you know, your, your previous keynote and maybe uh, what's changed or how you see the role of what you're doing change. And okay. so we're looking for big, big picture ideas here. Well, uh, I'll just, let me summarize briefly. Um, you know, the uh, great opportunity that I had to come out and speak in 2007, both to Black Hat and DEF CON. And, um, you, you know, in a lot of ways, it was sort of a coming out party. That is, we were really going public with a lot of things that we had been doing. 
And again, I've been, uh, have spent my life in the defensive side of this. And actually, we just celebrated a big 10th year anniversary at NSA. Uh, it was uh, June 26th or 7th, I forget exactly when. But 10 years ago, that was the um, summer of uh, 2001, we started releasing to the public security guidance at NSA through the, uh, through the public web presence. And I know that doesn't sound like much today, but that was a real culture changer for us and convincing you know, some really um, uh, understanding bosses that I worked for that that would be a good idea. That is to take guidance that we have been developing as an outgrowth of uh, red and blue team testing and product testing for the DOD, uh, putting it together in a more uh, general and broadly usable form and then just giving it away. And what I was uh, seeing at that time, and this is the early 2000s, was, you know, we all talk a good game about public-private partnership and, you know, we're all on the same net and we're trying to solve the same problem, but there isn't much work that's really aimed at solving the problem together. And the messaging that I was trying to get across was, we're part of the community, we're going to put our share out there for inspection. Uh, there were people looking for an NSA backdoor in it, I don't think anyone's found one yet. Uh, but the idea that was... That was a really good job you did hiding it. Uh, it we're incredible, I'll tell you. But the idea was, uh, you know, we have a shared problem, we need to share solutions, and the only way to do that was start putting things out there that we would just give away. And the point I made to my boss at the time, and he, and he uh, strongly endorsed it, was we, would, we, would, we were, would be able to gain more influence and cause more positive change by giving things away than we would by trying to uh, gain control of the environment, that is, be in charge of everything. So we had started that in the early 2000s. By 2007, the message that I brought was, uh, you know, this idea of cooperation across the private sector and government, and in particular for the government to bring its share of technical content to the table. And we had started on a massive campaign to start um, uh, working in open standards for security. So if you ever heard the term SCAP, security content automation protocols, a lot of that groundbreaking work came from my folks at the time. So how do we take things like good practice, NSA guides, NIST, um, DISA STIGs, if you know what those are, a NIST uh, checklists, I think they call them, and how do we take those and then automate them, right? So we, the problem that we're having, or one of the many problems we're having in this business is that we're asking poor, overworked, underpaid humans to manually configure, protect, and deal with things that are just beyond the scope of human ability to manage. So we need to do more things at scale, ask automation to help us, uh, get them directly from the vendor in a more securable fashion than trying to do it in the field. You know, for us, it's the DOD. And so that was the message that I was bringing, and the, a big part of that message was also, we're not just trying to foist this on you in the industry, but this is what we're going to do to ourselves at NSA. That is, we're going to break down the barriers between things like red teaming and blue teaming and product testing, and use the same standards to create information in the same form, so that we could naturally move from detecting a problem to fixing a problem. So that was, that was the message that I brought out here in 2007, it seemed to go pretty well. Uh, brought us a lot of new partners and it gave us a chance to kind of put the, the case on the table. One of the lessons I've learned over this, you know, I must be the most hopelessly naive guy in the room, but everything that I think could be solved in a year always takes three. And I'm just learning now to multiply all my estimates by three and it's not because people are lazy or don't care, it's because many of these things are really, really complicated. That is, um, you know, we've got a lot of problems to solve and they're not conceptually as hard as they are, in our terms, operationally hard. If you're trying to do something on the scale of a DOD, there's just a lot of things that have to go right. You know, everything from money to acquisition to training to technology. And you can't, you know, you can't any, ignore any one of those kinds of things. So that was, that was the message of the time. Now what would you say, um, yes. did you take any lessons away from your speech at DEF CON? Were you received positively, negatively? Did you think that you were a leper back at work for coming out and... <laughs> well, um, it, it took some convincing, right? You know, uh, <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> but uh, number one, the reception at both um, Black Hat and DEF CON was just overwhelmingly positive. You know, really, this idea of, um, of community and working together, you know, people, I think, weren't used to hearing that message as directly from the government. On the government side, it is complicated also, though. Uh, that is, uh, so here's a premise that I have. I, I think, I know you'd appreciate this, Jeff. I mean, the world that we're living in, right? Um, we're all using the same technology, good guy and bad guy. We're on the same network, good guy and bad guy. Uh, anything like the DOD, any enterprise is now hopelessly dependent upon all its partners and suppliers, right? They're, they're in your network, they're part of your supply chain. So the world is very deeply connected in a lot of ways. Mm. So the lesson for me 
that um, you know, sometimes I have to work to get people to understand, is that there is no boundary to something <coughs> like the Defense Department, right? There's no network perimeter, there's no boundary. I mean, we have, yeah, we have perimeter devices and all that, sure, but, but the perimeter really doesn't exist in the way we would like to think of it. And so, uh, because of all these factors, you can't secure the DOD, right? You can't make it better without everybody getting better. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone has to get better. And that's not a bad thing, right? That's an exciting and positive. But here's the real test. This is a test of uh, kind of culture and where you come from. At the end of that sentence, I would put comma, everyone has to get better, including the bad guys, right? If you're really gonna reshape the industry, have standards for security, uh, improve the content, that's the technology that yeah, everybody's using. When the water rises, even the bad guys' boats rise. Yeah. So learning to operate, you know, from our perspective <coughs> in the DOD, in, in such a complex <coughs> environment, yeah, I think is one of our great strategic challenges. So that's the lesson for me is to kind of, how do we think about this differently than, uh, you know, there's no neutral ground between us and them, right? We're really all connected in a, in a deep way that is just hard to, uh, that I don't think we can extricate ever again. So thanks. So in about 1997 or so, uh, I was with uh, Lou Gerstner, then head of IBM, <coughs> on a panel. Can you hear me in the back okay? Yeah, on a panel, and uh, he was asking, how do I know if I have an effective information assurance project program? And the answer was, walk down the hall, find a random employee, ask them three questions. Would you know if your computer is being screwed with? If yes, would you know who to call to get help? If yes, would you care enough to call? And the point was, unless you can answer yes for all three questions for all your employees, you can spend all the money you want on technology and you're going to fail on the people side. And this has struck me as a, a, an area where the government in particular needs to put a lot more emphasis, not just on building the, you know, the, the high-tech uh, team of cyber defenders or uh, warriors, whatever, but convincing the entirety of the workforce, A, and the leadership that these are issues for you know, commanders and policy makers and uh, decision makers, not just for the techies, and they have to be part of a, what permeates our day-to-day -day operating procedures. So I was really encouraged to see this defense strategy for operation in cyberspace that was rolled out a couple weeks ago, and I realized there were various critiques of it, but it does include much more emphasis on the entirety of the DOD workforce uh, becoming more aware and more capable in cyberspace and linking that to R&D. So if there's anything I'm cautiously optimistic about, it's that. Um, another thing, though, is that this, one of the things that's always struck me when I've come to DEF CON is the enormous amount of talent and energy and enthusiasm that's here in this room. Uh, and I've never regarded this as a, as a we, they sort of thing in the sense of uh, as I would love to get people here uh, to work more closely with the government. Uh, my point has always been as long as you haven't crossed the line, some line to felony conduct, uh, we'd love to work with you. And every year people come in and uh, uh, submit resumes. And uh, last year I was out here in the Air Force, I think had the ability to hire 50 people out of the audience. So I think this has been a change over time, is the government uh, becoming more recognizable. We don't have the, all the answers. You guys have a lot of the answers. How can we tap and work together on it? So I think that's uh, the hardware has come and gone, the, the gig, the higher walls and wider moats with angry alligators, the perimeter fences has fallen by the wayside. But, but this business of people and the emphasis on partnership, I think is one of the things I've always found valuable here. Okay, Bob. So I was trying That's to, a tough act to follow, huh? Yeah, it really is. I, I was trying to remember the first time, well, I think we met at what, DEF CON 3? No, two? we met at a pump con. Oh, something. that's, yeah, yeah, there you go. And probably in a parking lot somewhere. Um, and I, but I think around 94, 94, 95, I was here. And um, I was in the, had the unique perspective of being the guy at a pretty big ISP who saw what was going on. And I always kind of called it the Wild West because there really weren't a lot of rules yet. In fact, there weren't even a lot of laws yet um, for, to deal with what was going on out there. But at the same time, I was always sort of 
inherently optimistic that it would somehow be okay. And some of that meant there would be new products and new services that would try to help people protect themselves, and that wound up becoming an entire industry sector. Um, but also that people would kind of try to help each other in the process of figuring out how to make all this stuff work together. And I think what's one of the more interesting things that we had seen back then was that some of the groups that were doing standards work weren't doing it in quite as, I have to, have to be diplomatic here, <laughs> um, bureaucratic a way as some of the traditional standards bodies. And I remember this one phrase that, that sort of told me that I was in the right place, which is um, from the Internet Engineering Task Force. They said, we reject kings, presidents, and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. And I thought, wow, I like these guys. I can work with this. Um, but then I was getting phone calls at 4 o'clock in the morning when people were being hacked all the time. And, uh, and it, wasn't, it was sort of newsworthy, but people didn't even know to, to talk about it. Yet it, wasn't, it was so weird and unusual, it wasn't newsworthy yet. Um, but as time went on, I realized that you know, the internet is not a good place or a bad place. It's like the street. Good things, wonderful, miraculous things happen on the street. People save each other's lives, people meet and get married, wonderful things happen. But there are alleys that are kind of bad. And it doesn't make the whole place bad, it just makes some neighborhoods kind of bad. <laughs> And that has always sort of informed my perspective, and I've tried really hard not to color it. And I look back now, having spent some time trying to work with some of the folks addressing the government's concerns about some of these things, and then also working in one of the bigger companies that tries to build products for it's that. Yeah, when you're at and I realized that it's still pretty much like the street, but the good news is the citizenry have gotten more savvy and that I think my optimism has not been misplaced, that some of how we thought we would deal with these things is different than what we expected. In fact, I, I don't think when I started I would have ever expected the folks at Fort Meade to be producing really good readable guidance about how to do things like configure commodity operating systems that you could buy you know, off the shelf. And I thought that that was awesome, but I tell you, I never would have predicted that. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I look back and I think that, you know, if you look at the history of this conference and, uh, and its sister conference, part of why things have been manageable and part of why things have continued to, to it, it's bad out there sometimes, but we get better, even if some of the individual problems get worse, is because we've created environments where people can talk to each other. And I remember DEF CONs where there were no feds that admitted to being feds until someone pointed them out in the crowd. And yeah. you could probably count the total number on Oh, yeah. No, I, a hand. A, well, and the very first fed that, that I spotted, I didn't spot, he came up and revealed himself <laughs> at the end of the first DEF CON. And, uh, and he said, yeah, I'm from the Secret Service, and I uh, just wanted to say hi. <laughs> and I wanted to say hi, you know, Sunday evening after everybody was gone. Uh, but I said, yeah, I had invited the Secret Service, and they were saying, no, we can't comment, we can't be there officially. That sounds like policy, and we're enforcement. And so, you know, if you want somebody to show up officially, just talk to, you know, the administration, not, not us. And, uh, but they still sent somebody. And that gave me the idea for Spot the Fed, actually. It's like, okay, so if you are going to show up... <laughs> We're going to, you know, make it a little bit more fun. Okay, so we kind of know their perspective, where they're coming from. Uh, so I want to open up to the audience and see if anybody here has any questions. You want them to look forward, backwards, point fingers, whatever you'd like. So there's a microphone right here. All you got to do is uh, come up to it and say who you are, where you're coming from, what, what you want. So take it away. Hi, uh, my name is Power Cycle. I've uh, worked for two of the biggest DDoS defense companies um, in the U.S. I've uh, stopped more than like 500 uh, different attacks. And what I wonder to ask about is cyber war. Um, oh, can you speak just a little bit better in the mic? Okay. Yeah. It's, it's down a little low. Okay. What I wanted to ask about is the term cyber war. And uh, 
in past DEF CONs, the, the term has been actively in the titles and it doesn't seem to be in the, the titles now, which I, I'm happy about. Um, specifically because, uh, first off, the, the term cyber is kind of a punchline and a joke in this community. And I can see how, you know, outside of others, to the press and everything, you can use the word cyber and it doesn't really hurt anybody. But when you start to talk about war and it's paired with a joke, um, I think it's really uh, detrimental to the United States. Um, so what I wanted to ask you is, what's the difference between espionage and cyber war? And do you think that by continually using the word war in releases from the military, from the NSA, from um, the president, or from, from anybody in the government, do you think that leads us down the wrong path where you're not stopping thievery and bullying um, by overusing uh, military might and then just in the end crushing American freedom and not really even solving the problem. Okay, so pretty broad question, but Linton will start off. Well, I think if you look at the statements that Deputy Secretary Lynn and General Cartwright made in the rollout on July 14th, the cyber strategy, they went way out of their way to avoid the discussion of war and to be, you know, to, to caution people against using words like cyber attack when there's no distinction between somebody being pinged or whether you're actually even planning malicious code or whatever. So I think they were trying to walk back from the characterization. I, I, I wouldn't count DOD as being the principal um, proponent of the term cyber war. Uh, in fact, I think there's a discussion that basically says espionage, whether in cyberspace or anywhere else, has been going on among states for a long time and is likely to continue. Take that off the table as a distinct issue. The, the question here is at what point did the consequences of some kind of an attack mounted through cyber means you, you lead to loss of life, destruction, whatever, that becomes serious enough to be considered? But the generic sort of easy flow of cyber war is not something DOD is using at all. A yeah. lot of people are using it about DOD, but I don't think you're finding that from the official spokespeople. Did, didn't uh, in the, the release basically the United States say that a cyber attack on the United States would be retaliated against? I think they were very war. ambiguous. They, they were consciously ambiguous in the response. Because Why not be specific? Because one of the things one tries to do is to impose an uncertainty in the mind of the, from a deterrence point of view, against those who may wish you harm. And in addition, uh, the, the act of declaring war is a very complicated activity in the United States. You have all sorts of different people to get involved, and you're not just going to go in and say, ah, this is it, we're going to do it. You've got a lot of Isn't that just what we did in Tunisia? Pardon me? Isn't that what we're doing in, in Libya, I mean? So we're, let's just stay in cyberspace, right? I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to get into a big discussion about U.S. policy. I'm just saying that in the case, of, they, were ve they were very clear in the discussions on July 14th about uh, not being explicit in their red lines as to where, uh, what a cyber attack, what, what would constitute uh, various uh, acts, but also to reserve the right to respond through a wide variety of means if the level of damage uh, warranted it. So well, it's sort of like, um, let's say you attack the United States with, I don't know, a biological weapon. That doesn't mean we can only respond with biological weapons. We don't have any. Right. But so that, is that's that an actual like a physical attack where people actually get hurt in, in the sense of stealing a bunch of data from a corporation or from a, from a government department. Right. There's, there's no actual well, death. And well, I, when I you started your, your question on the, the cyber war versus the terminology and the definition, I think that's what we'll stick with, otherwise the conversation will explode. Um, but from my perspective, and I'm not really a panelist, so I'll just be short, it's that for me the, the language informs decisions, and if the language is warlike language, it sort of leads you down mentally a warlike path. And that's why I find it interesting the, the language that people who write about the DOD and the military always tend to stick the word war in there. Yeah. But when people write about sort of civilian and companies being attacked, it's always like cyber thugs and cyber criminals and organized crime because they're taking a law enforcement mentality. 
And the law enforcement mentality always is sort of like block watches and community watch and ground up and you know watch out for your neighbor and lock your doors. And the military mentality is it's much more you know very command and control. And so I think you're seeing these the people who write about both areas are now having to somehow reconcile that. And it's interesting to listen to the vocabulary because it's it is it's changing. There's a reason why you don't see a lot of talks that say cyber war at DEF CON anymore because everybody realizes that's kind of nonsensical and they're starting to sound dumb if they put that in their titles. Um, so I'll let Tony respond, and then we'll move on to the next question. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Oh, just just a word or two to echo uh, Dr. Wells. I mean, the, and I don't think you'll see that kind of language. Come, you know, the, the war has a particular meaning in the Defense yeah. Department. Yeah. Right? That leads us to places that you know no one's going right now. Uh, I will say that I'll just comment briefly on your uh, the use of the word cyber. Though you made a comment about that. I was in a room full of defense contractors and. And I said, okay, everybody raise your hand if you have a, uh, a gigantic room full of fancy screens and blinking lights and the name cyber is somewhere, uh, the, the phrase cyber is somewhere in the name of that room. And all, all the hands go up. And I said, and then how many of you a year ago that, that room had the name IO or information operations in the title instead of cyber? And most of the hands stay up. And I said, and then two years before that, how many had that same room but the title computer network operations was in the title, the phrase was in that title instead? And sheepish hands are still kind of hanging around. You know, it's people kind of gravitate to the buzzword of the day because that drives uh, attention, funding, you know, and so forth. And uh, it is overused. I don't, there's no question about that. Do you want to say something? Yeah, Bob? just yeah. real quick. And I have no affiliation with these guys, but I recently discovered a site called something like, if I use the prefix cyber, will it make me look like an idiot dot com? <laughs> <laughs> and there's this great sort of expert system decision tree and it's like are you trying to get money from this particular type of customer and it walks you through these decisions and it gives you kind of probability ratings of how much of an idiot you'll sound like if you use it and one of the questions the qualifying questions way down in there is are you preparing a presentation for the US government Excellent. yeah <laughs> So you're not alone in now asking that. I know why that. they're all so consistent. They're, they're all so consistent because they use the site. Right. So, so just to amplify that one more time, uh, we, we had a conference on cyber or something in, in DOD <laughs> and about 150 people in the room. And my question was, all right, how many of you are under 35? It's like seven hands go up. And so the question was, okay, uh, you know, what, what questions should we be asking here that, that we're not? And a 20-something-year-old lieutenant got up and said, well, you know, nobody in my generation uses the word cyber. Uh, we may be connected, we may be online, we may be LinkedIn, maybe whatever, but cyber is just not a term that's part of our vocabulary. And so if you're building all this great vocabulary around cyberspace and cyber whatever, and a large part of the young people who are operating and they don't really understand what you're talking about, maybe you should give some thought to that. So... Yeah. yeah. Well, my problem's not with cyber, it's with war. And I, and I would just, I think our war is not a term the DOD will use in this case. Next uh, question. Good afternoon, panel. Can you hear me okay? My name is Joe from North Carolina. And my question is, if you were to give another keynote speech, what would it be? Oh, that's a good N one. Another what? If you were to give another keynote speech, what would it be? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. uh, actually, I, um, a talk that I've given recently is uh, my perspective on what I think the future of cyber defense is going to be about. Okay, so I'll just give you the quick summary of it. Uh, and the, 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 the bottom line conclusion is I think the, the key to success in defending ourselves in this mythical cyberspace is solving what I call the, uh, the massive information management problem. So we happen to be, and here's a quick summary of the talk, um, we happen to be at a state where the vast majority of problems that plague us today, that cost us money, that bring our systems down, here's the sad news for the defense, right? And you all know this. The vast, vast majority of those problems are known problems with known solutions. And that's a pretty sad indictment of our community, frankly. Uh, it, it doesn't, again, it's not an indictment that people are lazy or don't care. It tells you how operationally challenging this problem is, right? So from having a tool to solving a problem can be night and day. But my observation over 30 years of this is, you, you know, the things that, uh, the knowledge that we need to defend ourselves, 
predict the next attack, minimize the next one, etc., is already out there somewhere. It's just not in the right spot, at the right time, in the right form. And so there's a whole talk that I give that's kind of around how do we organize the way we collect, store, move, query for information that would allow us to understand what the real problem is that we're trying to solve. And we've thought of this too much, I think, as a technology problem. If we could just buy the right, buy the right thing, then we would be able to defend ourselves. And that's just not going to happen. And it turns out, you know, the term that's used in the intelligence business is, how can I look over the horizon, right? How, how can I see what's coming? And the, I only know two ways to look over the horizon. One is have friends who happen to live over the horizon and who are both ready, willing, and able to communicate with you, right, to share information. And not through meetings and not through email, but through technology, right? We can't, we can't move it fast enough by calling our friends to warn them. It's just not going not gonna to happen. So you, you have to have friends that are over the horizon to help you look. And, and then you have to have an intelligence business, right? You have to be able to look more deeply into what's going on outside of your own boundaries and be able to understand. And we have to remember that bad guys are uh, just like us. They're just bad. That is, their tools don't appear out of thin air, right? They have to conceptualize them, design them, build them, test them, equip them, and all this kind of stuff. And if you can't sort of get in the cycle of understanding that, then you'll never be able to defend yourself. So the bottom line premise for me, and I've given this talk a couple times, so I'm cheating a little bit on your answer, but if I had another keynote, I'd come back to talk about kind of what I think we need to do around the, the uh, sort of massive management of information. We have massive amounts that, that are just is not available in the right form, in the right place at the right time, that I think we could manage the 95% of this problem with that. Thank you. I think I would talk about mission assurance in a time of exponential change, taking into account the behavior of real people. Um, you know, I originally started off focusing on information assurance, but in point of fact, the, the, you need to be able to accomplish the mission, uh, irrespective of the level of attack you're under. And uh, my own background is Navy, and you never design a ship with the expectation the water's not going to get inside the hull. So I think we should expect that the systems we're using are going to be compromised in some sense and not maintain this, uh, this ideal objective of a, of a firm perimeter. And so if you know, the attack is not going to cause you to be operating 100% one day and then zero the next, it's going to be some kind of a degradation which is going to come back over time. So the goal should be to minimize the depth and the width of that bathtub. Uh, and, and again, to be able to accomplish whatever plan B, C, or D you need to get the, the mission done. But the point about uh, taking into account real people, uh, you know, the, one of the things the Deputy Secretary Lynn talked about in his uh, Foreign Affairs article last uh, fall was you know, declassifying the whole Buckshot Yankee business with the thumb drives. I mean, that was essentially a case where people were charged with getting the job done and say, fine, I'm going to, you know, the security is too obvious for me to get the job done and go around it and got bitten. So how do you find a way to balance things that people can... Um, and then the technological change. Um, if you look at the 15-year horizon and you believe Moore's law at 18 months, so 18 months is 10 doubling, 15 years is 10 doublings, 2 to the 10th is 1024, that's a 100,000% change in computing capacity per unit time, per unit cost in 15 years. Linear projections are just not going to work. And in getting to your, your person living over the horizon, we just need to be thinking more in terms of that. So. you have anything to say, Bob? Or do you want to just uh, move on to the next question? I'll just say, I, I think the, uh, for me, the, the the big message that I would probably come out with is that, um, and I'm saying this particularly in the context of interacting with the United States government in all its many forms, is that change is possible. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it sounds kind of simple, but um, I, I was a part of this grand experiment to try to figure out how to get early state access to early stage technology to a part of the government that felt like they weren't they didn't have that the way they did 20 years before, say, in the 70s. And you could argue that some of it kind of worked. So I, I have to do this as a show of uh, hands. How many people here have used Google Earth? Okay. So when I was at this experimental thing called InQtel, making venture capital investments, we were faced with this problem. 
how do you take high resolution imagery, send it over low speed connections, and render it on commodity computing hardware? Because your alternative is a guy with a mainframe and a basement and an air conditioned building printing out maps who's nowhere near the guys who need the maps. And I looked at probably five different technology approaches to this, and we found this little company that admittedly, ironically, had named itself Keyhole, that had only <laughs> been used by realtors in Cal uh, California to show houses. And we made an investment. I think it may have been their first round of investment. And eventually Google bought them, and that's called Google Earth. So don't think that things the government is doing to solve hard problems that it has may not directly also address hard problems that we all have. And so one of the messages I had to take into them was, your problems are not that special sometimes. And if you persist on believing they're special, you're gonna get solutions that are only good for you, which means they're gonna be expensive and you're gonna be the only customer and that kind of thing. And the message I took to everybody else was, they're not that weird <laughs> and the things that will help you will help them too. And I would argue mm -hmm. that at least a little bit of change happened there. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been a couple of other examples too. So I would say change is possible would be the, the next yeah. keynote. Do you have a follow-up comment? To, just to reinforce that point, yesterday and the day before I was over in uh, Camp Roberts in Central California where we do quarterly field experiments around geospatial information. And the whole two days that I was there, one of the tracks was spent on a discussion with National Geospatial Intelligence Agency on how to get imagery released to people who need it in time. And this was a you know, hundred questions about, well, what about the, um, how would the companies who sell us the imagery at very preferential rates feel about the downstream use of vector uh, imagery, or vector uh, uh, products uh, that may have been released to somebody in a disaster for 30 days and then afterwards it gets sold, you know, things like that. And it, it, was, it was just, and the whole point at the end of that was we actually got a whole batch of like 30 different lawyers to agree astonishing uh, and you lock them in a tra trailer in the desert and open the door to let they come out but anyway that uh, this this was a way forward that more and better product could be released more quickly to the public so I agree with him change is possible it's often it appears to be slow but there if you go back and look to 2000 an enormous amount of change so next uh, thank you next question. question hey there I'm CZ. Hmm. I'll bend down a bit. <laughs> My name is CZ, and um, I've got a question for you about threat profiles and how they've been changing recently. I've kind of been around the block, and you know, we've done with the standard, you know, amateurs, professionals, nation states, that sort of thing, giving us trouble. And as of late, we've seen a new thing come out, which is one might call it um, position-based. I.e., I don't like your position, therefore. You know, I'm going to, it used to just be I'm going to randomly clug you, but now it seems to be moving into I'm going to raise a million dollars on, you know, whatever, and then fund some real attacks against you. So what do you see um, in the future as the impact of money on these sorts of threats? Sort of and like as more money pops in, you know, where do things go? Sort of like a crowdsourcing uh, enough nickels and dimes to get a war chest. Yeah, here's five dollars. You know, get everybody here to give me five dollars, and now I've got a lot of money. So how does that start changing the threat profile from the standard one that I've been dealing with for the past eh, 15 years? Good question. Very good. And with that question, <laughs> <laughs> well, nope, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, I'll, I'll put my former Symantec guy hat on. Um, we actually did a study for a year when I was there looking at the underground economy and actually quantifying, in some cases, the value of inventory that some of these people had and were trying to sell and, and that kind of thing. And um, uh, it's, it, there are viable markets and they scale really nicely, um, which is perhaps not a good thing for us, but it, it gives you food for thought. You know, I think that um, there have been pecuniary motivations for uh, 
malicious software and, and uh, computer intrusions for a really long time. It's really important to remember the Pakistani brain virus, which many in this room will not remember. Uh, and I don't remember what year, what was that, 80, like 87 or something? Well, I think Miko like, Hyponin just did a talk on the 25th anniversary of the first virus. It, it was basically these guys who ran a computer repair shop in Pakistan who wanted to drive business to themselves, so they wrote this virus. And so you can argue that in some ways the, the, the monetary motivation has is really not changed, it's just scaled up. Um, at the same time, there have been defacements and, and uh, message-oriented attacks. Digital, digital de denial of service sit-ins against the WTO. Right, or, yeah. for a really long time as well. I mean, we were seeing some of that, like when I was at UUNet in the early 90s, I mean, there were people starting to do some of those things. So I, I think the difference really is just, it's, it's like any other industry that matures. You know, you can look at the history of any industry, you look at the history of air travel, right? It matures, there are sketchy aspects to it along the way, both in terms of who's providing services, in terms of who's using services. Um, and I think that this is, I guess from my perspective, is like the street. We don't think much when we see graffiti on the street. I, I, I mean, I don't know about most people here, but I see it and I kind of, mm -hmm. it's like a fact of life. And I'm not saying these things are good, but I, I think at some level these, we still notice these because these are still arguably new to us. I'm not sure that mm. some level of these things won't be noise going forward into the future. We'll just accept them. Hopefully our systems will be built with some minimum level of, of uh, robustness in the face of them. But in that respect, I'm not sure it's changed that much. That's, well, that's my... we'll move on. Uh, if anybody else has a comment, we've got only about five or ten minutes left for questions. I want to get through the, the remaining folks here. So, if, if, uh, Linton or, or uh, do you have any comments on the last question? No. Nope. Go to the next one. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> so I, I think we've all seen a, a sort of a degradation of uh, privacy over time, and uh, obviously the technology has changed, and technology keeps changing faster and faster. But I was wondering if you uh, each see a possibility of having a, a world where we still have free, uh, privacy uh, and security at the same time, or if it's one or the other, and we're just you know going from having a lot of uh, privacy to having none. Thank you. It, it seems to me that one of the privacy questions, and I'm, I'm I've got to tread very carefully in this as a govy because clearly we we're committed to for a whole variety of laws and ethics around privacy but the concern to me in privacy is the extent to which while giving it away in the interest of commercial gain I mean, we're, or convenience or whatever we we, we share our locations via our cell phones you can you know, there are all sorts of companies who say uh, where this uh, location-based service information is marketed to, to a uh, Department store to know that you know the on the third floor men's department there are people uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning an average of 3.4 customers who've driven six miles to get there and stay for 13 minutes but if I offer a 20 percent sale I'll get six I mean all that stuff is out there and we don't seem to be caring about the privacy ramifications of what um, what chicken could come home to roost with that. So, you know, from my standpoint in the government, we will defend very uh, uh, vigilantly the, the sets of laws and rules we're under. I just worry in the broader societal context about how much this is being undercut by, uh, by what's happening in... in uh, like voluntarily giving away voluntary, information. Yeah, right, yeah. Voluntary mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have much to add. I mean, whatever you think of the National Security Agency, you know, folks like me don't stay there because we uh, don't like the Constitution and don't care about laws. You know, we really do. And you'll, if you want to hear heated debates about such topics, you know, get inside our borders sometime. But the, the, the challenge is this, the short-term incentive that people have, you know, just to get a sale price or whatever. You know, when you give information away, you sort of give it away forever, right? And the long-term implications are the really frightening part of this, which is you, you can't pull it back. And, uh, you know, I've got three kids. I want them to grow up in a world where they feel safe and, the, you know, their information, they have some sense of control over it. And in a lot of ways, we are giving away control of information at, 
at massive scale. So I'm not sure whether you know, these are questions for big, big thinkers about the sociology of the future to, to talk about. But you know, clearly there's, there's things that we need to do on the technical part of this, right? So that you know what happens to information, right? That, that, that machines, that, that there's a certain level of due care about the handling of information. That clearly doesn't exist today, right? That, and so any, anyone who's, you know, the previous question about uh, hacktivism and political interests, uh, you know, people that have no business having access to information today can do that and cause long-term implications for you as, a, you as an individual. And we, at least on the technical side, we've got to find ways to manage that much better. That, that it's just not so trivial to give that away and lose control of it forever. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think these will be the two last questions here. Hi, um, my question might actually be for the Department of Education, but I thought I'd ask these guys too. Um, <laughs> There's an educator. Basically, back in the day, there used to be things like home ec and driver's ed and things like that that you had to do in high school. Is there any push to get things like cyber, I mean, not cybersecurity, information security or information assurance into the curriculum in schools so that we actually educate the population? Well, I mean, certainly in the STEM education programs, uh, there are a number of efforts. I don't know if you've seen that. You've got DEF CON kids here aimed at 8 to 16-year-olds. Uh, so I think there are, but I'm not sure it's anything more than hit and miss and uh, somebody particularly is interested in, in doing this. I mean, NSA has a very, the nation has a very, uh, um, uh, what, a robust, uh, training project for cybersecurity. Yeah. I don't know if that really gets to your question about how do I how do I raise a responsible digital citizen through our normal education processes. Well, there's a, what the, the NSA centers of. Uh, yeah, I'll mention that yeah. we, we co-sponsor with um, uh, with DHS a program called the Centers of Academic Excellence in Information Assurance. And there's sorry, I don't know the numbers, but there's 100 plus schools that are involved with that. There's, uh, you know, we review curriculum and they, you know, they qualify or not under that program. And, uh, the con and that started, I think, over 10 years ago. The concern there was uh, both the general education, but also increasing the pool of people that can work in this business. And there's a lot of recognition nationally now that the, the pool of, of practitioners is just not big enough, right, for the DOD, for private industry, for everybody. And so we both need practitioners, but also general understanding. So there's a number of activities that we're involved with and other parts of government to um, look at this. There's a number of private sector organizations that have popped up, you know, and the kind of the, the common wisdom is the pool is several multiples smaller than it needs to be. If we can't increase that pool, then we, re we uh, stay at what I would call the cannibalization stage, right, where we're, we're filling our needs by hiring them from the other guy, not by bringing new people into the pool. So we really have to get over that nationally, find a way to increase the number of uh, uh, folks. And we've invested pretty heavily uh, from NSA with other partners across government. But uh, you know, that, that's been a big success for us. In fact, it turns out, uh, again, I don't know the exact numbers, but I believe most of our hiring of people directly out of school, as opposed to transfers from the military or whatever, most of our hiring is now from those centers, centers that have, you know, whose curriculum we've, been, we've worked with them on. Yeah, I actually attended one, so I appreciate that. Oh, yeah, uh, oh, very good, thanks. I think that you can see, I'm sorry, you, I think you can also see the DHS trying to struggle with messaging with their Stop, Think, Connect program. So it's, yeah. you know, it's entering the consciousness of, of education and awareness training, but I'm not sure that there's the, what are the, the cyber collegiate defense of the CCDC uh, cyber challenge for universities to compete as an incentive right. to give these guys uh, an outlet, you know, a legitimate outlet to compete in, in attacking. Um, so I think... The education system is fractured and they're trying a bunch of stuff. We're sort of in that laboratory phase, I would say. Okay. Um, my wife and I were watching the Discovery, I think it was the Discovery Channel. We watched, they were talking about this uh, poor, these, this poor community, some part of the world, and they had figured out a, a novel way to do fishing. They would use uh, kites and then they would send the kite out and they would drop the bait from the kites and then they would catch the fish. And to me, that sort of, um, is the essence of hacking, using something that, you mm. know, using something in a way that it wasn't intended to be used. And in this case, they were using it to improve their lives. Yeah. Uh, is there anything that you guys, from your experience or from your insight, can see, uh, in a, uh, is there any technologies that you guys can see that can be used, simple technologies, that can be sort of, quote unquote, hacked 
to improve our lives. We talk a lot about information security and people trying to break into things, but what about breaking things to make things? That would be like maybe like, I don't know, taking a, app, a product that does one thing and make it do another and that other thing happens to be really useful. Yeah. yeah I mean, there's, there's a great stories about people hacking bicycles in Africa. Uh, to turn them into uh, knife grinding, uh, scissor sharpening, and, uh, and generators. You, you pedal and, and charge people's phones and things like that. So I think the whole issue of hacking equipment is really interesting. To, to me, in this case, one of the explosively innovation areas that we're going to see is three-dimensional printing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I just, I don't think, I, I certainly, in the last couple of weeks, hadn't begun to realize the potential implication this has, not only in what you can make for what you intended it to, but in this idea of hacking it for unintended uh, uses. Yeah, the three-dimensional printing stuff's amazing. It really is. <laughs> yes, yes, we hear you. <laughs> All right, so uh, with that, I'd like to get a round of applause for the, the audience. I'm from the audience. And uh, are you guys, are you guys going to be in the Q&A room for a little bit to see if there's any interest? So there's a Q&A room, of course, following each session. Uh, our speakers will be there for a little bit in case there's any questions. You can follow us. Uh, oh, wait. I've, got, I've got to go do something. But, but you can follow the speakers and ask uh, more one-on-one -on -one type questions with them if you'd like. And then if... Down the hall, almost all the way, second to last room on the right. Down the hall, second to last room on the right, or you can just follow the speakers. So uh, again, thank you very much, and I'll see you around at the con. Have a good, good adventure here this weekend. Uh, the blood drive tanks were full in one hour. Oh. We overwhelmed them. They have no idea. And there's a 12 page list of people who are coming back to get blood and marrow. So you guys rock. Wow. Thank you. Wow.